So if we want to build some kind of output display for a computer, we can use a register just like uh, we've built in the past, where we can push a value into that register and then have some way of displaying the contents of the register, and this would be the output of the computer. And so in this case, you can see we have a nice binary output for, for the computer. But what would be much nicer is if when we put contents into that register, instead of getting a binary output, we get a nice decimal output like this, which is uh, much more user-friendly. So let's take a look at how these display modules work. So you can see there's some pins on the back, and then of course our display here. And here's the data sheet that comes with it, or I guess just sort of the, the packaging. And it comes in a couple different kinds. The one that I have is blue, and it uh, says common anode. What that means is that there's a bunch of LEDs inside this package, you know, for each of these different segments. And all of the anodes are tied together. So that's the positive side of, the, uh, of each of these LEDs are tied together and on pins three and eight. So pins three and eight are just the middle pins on both sides. So this is pin three, and then this is pin eight here in the middle on the, on the other side. And then the rest of the pins just control the different segments. So we can hook this up on our breadboard, and I'm gonna connect the anode, this is the, the common anode, which is either pin three or pin eight, uh, to our five volt supply. So this is pin eight up here. And I'm gonna connect that with a 100 ohm resistor, and that's because this is the blue one, so it's got a three volt forward voltage, which means that the uh, resistor needs to drop two volts, because uh, three plus two is five. Uh, and I'm guessing, it doesn't actually tell me the current draw on this thing, but I'm guessing 20 milliamps would be good, so a 100 ohm resistor should, should work fine. And I'll connect power, uh, this is just five volts. And then if we connect ground to any of these other pins, we should see stuff light up. So this is that first segment, second segment, third segment, fourth, fifth, sixth, and this is the middle segment. And then down here is also the decimal point. And so you can see the inputs to this thing don't really let us uh, input numbers per se. You know, we're not, we're not, there's not a binary input that just then displays a number. Uh, we have to display numbers sort of on our own by lighting up just the right segments. So if we want to light up the number one, we have to connect those two segments. If we want to do the number two, then we have to find all, all the right segments for number two. So it's those two, and let's see, it's probably this one, and then this one down here, and then finally, this bottom one. And that's how you get the number two, is we have to, we have to manually know exactly which segments to light up to get each number. But of course, we have a binary number that we want to display, so how do we, how do we convert that? So a good approach when you don't know how to solve a problem is to try to simplify the problem uh, and, and try to solve that simpler problem. So in this case, let's, let's try to solve this problem for we only have four bits. So instead of thinking about eight bits and how we display that with three digits, let's think about how we display four bits. Uh, so these are, this is essentially what we want to display for each of these bits, you know, zero through nine. And then when we get above nine to 10, instead of trying to display that as two digits, we can display those as letters. Uh, and this would basically just give us a, a hexadecimal display. So instead of 10, 11, 12, and so forth, we have A, B, C, D, E, and F. And F represents 15. So this gives us a, a, different, a different display for each of the uh, 16 values that you can have with four digits of binary. So these are all of the different numbers, or, or I guess digits, or things we want to display. Um, and we can create a truth table that, that looks at each of those cases. And to simplify things even further, what we can do is actually just look at a single segment in each of these and try to solve each segment by itself. So instead of looking at the whole number, let's just look at one segment. In fact, we'll start with this segment on the top here. And what you'll notice is that for any of these segments, we can control whether it's on or off by setting the, the pin for that segment to either five volts, in which case it's off, or ground, in which case it's on. And, that, and that's because these are uh, these common anode. Um, if I had the common cathode one, then it would be the other way around. Uh, and you could use the same sort of logic, but since these are the ones I have, we'll, we'll do it this way. And so basically, if this input is, is ground or a zero, a logic zero, then that segment is on. If that pin is a logic one, or five volts, then that segment's off because you've got five volts on both sides of that LED, and so there's no current flowing. So with that in mind, 
we can come up with a truth table for that segment. This is the, the A segment. Each of these segments kind of by convention has a, a letter associated with it. So A is this top one. So if we look at just that segment, we can see, well, for zero, it's on. So that would be a zero, right? Because we want that segment to be on, which means we want the input for it to be at ground or zero, and that turns it on. For one, it's off. So that's a one. For two, it's on. So that's a zero. For three, it's on. So that's a zero. For four, it's off. For five, it's on. For six, it's on. For seven, it's on. For eight, it's on. For nine, it's on. For A, it's on. For B, it's off. So that's a one. For C, it's on. For D, it's off. And then for E and F, it's on. And so what we've got here is a truth table that says, if you have these inputs, we want that output. If you have these inputs, we want that output. And so now the question becomes, well, can we build a circuit that satisfies this truth table, some kind of logic circuit? And if we could do that, then that gives us the logic required to tell us when we should turn on that top segment. And then we could do the same thing for the rest of the segments. So here's the circuit that I came up with that satisfies this truth table. And so what you can see is we've got the inputs D0, D1, D2, and D3, which correspond to our four uh, bit binary number that's coming in. And then we have those, those four inputs, so it's D0, D1, D2, and D3, and then I've also inverted all of them. So we also have the complement of D0, D1, D2, and D3 over here. And then what I'm doing is using a combination of AND gates and OR gates to decide whether this final output should be a one or a zero. And the way that I, that I did this is by looking down this column here at, at our outputs and looking at, well, when do we want our output to be one? And it turns out there's only four times that we actually want our output to be one. We want it to be one here, 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 and here. And so if you look at just one of those cases, when the outputs are one, the inputs are, one, are you know, zero, 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 one. And so that's actually what these three AND gates do here. You can almost think of these three AND gates as a, as a four input AND gate. Um, I'm just using two input AND gates uh, for because it's what I have. But what you see is I'm, I'm taking, I'm ANDing together D0. So when D0 is one, like this, when D1, D2, and D3 are all zeros, because if they're zeros, then the complement of them will be ones, and then all four of these inputs will be one. And if all four of those inputs are one, then both of these outputs are one, and this output is a one. And then that output there gets ORed together with the rest of this stuff, um, and, and will eventually turn the final output on, uh, this A, which of course means that that input will be a one, and the segment will be off, just like it should be for the number one. That top segment's not on in, in number one. Same thing for, uh, for here, this is uh, uh, the number four. You can see number four, it's also off. So with number four, D2 is high, but D0, D1, and D3 are low. So you can see D2, when that's a one, but when D0, D1, and D3, when their complements are one, so when they're zero, then we end all that together, and that also goes into this OR gate. And so if any of these conditions applies, then we turn that on. Same thing down here, and this is for 11, or, or B, Right, because B, we also don't have that top segment on. And so for B, D0, D1, and D3 are ones, and D2 is a zero. So D0, D1, and D3, when those are all one, and when the complement of D2 is a one, so in other words, when D2 is zero, if all of that is true, then we also turn on our output. And then finally, for D, the letter D, which is here, that top segment's also not on. So for D, we have D0 is a 1, D1 is a 0, D2 and D3 are 1s. And so that's what's going on down here. And actually, I, I took a little bit of a shortcut and saved ourselves an AND gate because for D0 to be on and D1 to be off, we've already got that up here. And so I can just pull that down uh, and, and save, save an AND gate. But then, of course, AND together the case where D2 and D3 are both 1s. And so if all that's true, then we also turned on. So any of these four conditions where this output should be one, we OR those together and the output is one. Otherwise, if we're in any other state, this output will be zero. And so this circuit 
gives us everything we need in order to determine whether, you know, this one top segment, this segment here should be on or off given a 4-bit input. And so you can imagine if we do the same thing for each of these seven segments and build a, a similar circuit, but of course come up with the truth table for, for each of those different segments and build seven, essentially build seven of these circuits, we could, we, we would end up with a circuit that fully, fully implements this decoding. And if you're thinking that sounds like an awful lot of work, you're, you're right, it is an awful lot of work. And, and I'll show you in the next video a much, a much quicker way, or a much easier way, I guess, of, of doing this. But just to demonstrate the point, uh, I'll go ahead and fill out the rest of, of the truth table here. And so if I haven't made any mistakes, this is the full truth table for a decoder that decodes four bits of binary to one of these hexadecimal digits. And I guess I can, you know, just spot checking a few things. It looks like eight, so one zero 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 is eight. And all of those are zeros, which makes sense because for eight, all of the, all of the segments are on. Uh, so at least I didn't make a mistake there. But assuming I didn't make any mistakes here, this is the truth table that will get us a circuit that does this. And so I realize this is a little bit messy, but this is the circuit that I came up with. And you can see it's very similar uh, to, to the circuit that we saw before, which has the D0 through D3, and then the inverted D0 through D3. Uh, and then we're, we're looking at, at combinations of those. So same thing, and in fact this top part here is identical to what we did for segment A. And then there's additional parts for segment B, C, D, E, and F, and G. Uh, but again, I was able to save some gates because in some cases some of these things were, were used previously and, and I, could, I could save some gates. But even said, very complex circuit, or at least very large circuit in, in terms of number of gates. And I imagine there's probably some people watching this that can look at this and find ways to you know, simplify it a little bit and, and remove some of these gates. But still, it's going to be you know, fairly, fairly complex. And so just to demonstrate that, of course I built the thing. And this is what it looks like. And you can see there's an awful lot going on here. And it's because we've got, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 OR gates. And those 17 OR gates are, are implemented on these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 74 LS32s. And then there's, gosh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 AND gates. And those 33 AND gates are on these 74 LS08s, which each have four AND gates. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 of those. Uh, and then, of course, we've got these four inverters, which are on the 74 LS04. And so this here should represent this circuit, unless I made some mistake somewhere, but I have tested it and it works. So you can see, when we plug it in, we get zero because our input down here is zero. But we can cycle through and see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so you can see the, the circuit works fine, but uh, boy, it's really complicated. And you can imagine that a circuit this complex, just to do four bits, essentially implementing this truth table, uh, you can imagine that if we had eight bits of input, and instead of one digit of output, we had three digits of output, which is what you need in order to display the numbers you know, 0 through 255, which is what you get with eight uh, bits of input. You'd have eight bits of input and, and 21 bits of output for the seven segments times three displays. And the circuit would get significantly more complicated. Uh, and so we don't really want to build something quite that complicated. So in the next video, I'm going to show you a way to use EEPROMs to replace any combinational logic circuit. And this is a combinational logic circuit because basically it has, for each input, there's a single output and it doesn't depend on state or anything. So there's, there's kind of two kinds of logic circuits. There's combinational logic, which is like this. So for whatever input we give it, 
we get a particular output, and it's, the output is just a function of the inputs. Uh, and then there's uh, sequential logic, which is you know, things like latches and flip-flops and counters and some of, the, some of the other things we've seen, where the current state of it depends on what happened previously, and there's usually a clock involved, uh, and that's sequential logic. But for something like this, which is purely combinational logic, there's a simpler and more flexible way to build pretty much any combinational logic circuit using EEPROMs. And so we'll explore that and look at building our output register in the next videos.